Yeah, that's very stuck. <laughs> yeah. But I guess since we are running out of time a bit, uh, it's a previous talk, I should start. Um, so my name is um, Michael. I, I work for OpenMismos, that's a um, German um, software consulting company. And um, over the last year, I've been involved with the input methods for MIGO. Um, the goal of this uh, talk is to show you sh some of the features of um, the input methods framework. And so that you have a better idea of what's possible and what um, application developers might expect from your input method. Then, of course, the other goal is to help to get you started creating your own input method by, by giving some pointers where to find the sources or what pitfalls await you so that you don't necessi necessarily fall into them. Um, so as our input method framework comes with a reference keyboard, it's probably the best idea to start um, with the features that are going to be available in MIGO 1.3. So even though 1.2 is just out of the door, we focus on, well, I as a developer, because always focus on the next version. The current one is boring to me. So let's start with some new features in MIGA 1.3. So first, we're going to have a improved theming, especially for netbook, then Chinese layout and support for Chinese input method engines, key magnifier so that you see what you type, and extended keys that will pop up on long press and bring you up the selection of um, special keys so that you don't have to always go to the symbol view. Then a feature that we call dynamic key overrides, which lets the application control uh, the appearance of the return key in this case. So it can dynamically, the application can dynamically enable it, disable this button, or change the label, change the icon, appearance, whatever. Um, actually, we like that feature so much that we're probably going to extend this. Oh yeah, and of course, because QML is all the hype, we're going to support QML plugins just a bit better than MIGO 1.3. So, um, the, the MIGO input methods um, now, since this year, or since um, early this year, we actually have a wiki. Project name is Mali, which um, means little things, basically. Mali provides text input services and it can support different UI toolkits. I'll come to that later. Uh, as a framework, as a, it is highly pluggable. Um, so you can use different input methods, um, but also different input method engines. It, it comes as a um, client-server architecture, and the biggest benefit of that is actually that you cut down on startup time for each application, because instead of having to load um, the, the, the plugins every time, you just have to make a connection to the server. And um, another advantage actually is stability. You don't want your application to crash only because some third party plugin but give up. So um, everything that's on the on the on the left side, you see in, in the orange colors, is living in the client process. Everything on the right is in the server process. So on the left we have the application itself, which usually has some comp some input widget and um, an input context. That the input context is um, an architecture that's used by both Qt and GDK. And Qt, this input context is um, um, application-wide. So you only have one input context per application. Um, this input context um, is used to, 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 to fetch these input method events and then get them somehow into the input widget. Um, we use this input context um, to, to, to establish a connection to the, to the framework. So the uh, input context connection, which is already part of the server process. And this input method server is then also responsible for loading these different input method plugins. And so you can switch between these plugins dynamically. Then each input method plugin can freely build up its UI. It can make use of the feedback system or it can choose to use an input method engine. For Western languages, input method engines 
are not that critical, but it actually really becomes important once you go to uh, CJK languages. Yeah. So, different UI toolkits. That's what this architecture also allows. And this is, for example, Mali running with the reference keyboard in GNOME Shell. So you can see that the, um, also the seeming is very, very different, but this was only um, a couple of hours of work to get it to look like this. It was way more, way more complicated to get this input context for GTK to work properly. And well, yeah, some stuff is still not working correctly, but we have something that, that we can show, we can go from the login screen, bring up the keyboard, go to the session, we can, we can start the browser, use it there, or use an editor, use a keyboard there. So, yeah, that's possible because of our architecture. We are not, I mean, even though we implement all our stuff in Qt, it doesn't prevent us, due to the server client architecture, to, to have the application running in a different um, toolkit. So let's go into more into detail what this, um, how this input method plugin fits, uh, fits into the architecture. So, as I said earlier, the input method plugin is free to choose um, whether it wants to use um, the, the feedback system. And it can use the feedbacks or reaction maps interface. Um, the feedback system is for, for haptic uh, feedback, of course. Um, there's currently no, no back end available in Migo, but one could write a very simple one that just makes beep whenever you press the screen. It also depends actually on, on each device, whether the device has um, some, some feedback mechanism for the display itself. So you can't really have a general solution. We can only provide interfaces. And then it depends on the um, device integrators to actually talk to us and come up with drivers. Yeah. The other part is um, the, the engine interface. So there are two interfaces available now. One for handwriting recognition, and one for words that you can use for error correction or word prediction. Um, there, it's um, kind of sad that we don't have an engine available for for, for Migo because this is not device specific. It's just that someone has to do it. The, the, then, of course, at one point, the input method plugin needs to talk to the application. Um, you need to get the uh, the input to the application somehow. And for that, you use the input method host, which interface, which allows you to, to either talk to the application direc uh, directly tr tr through the input context connection, or you can also make some requests for to the input method server. Um, that's quite a big interface, so I'm, I'm not going into detail what, what it can all provide. It's more important to know how this interaction works so the input method plugin uses this input method host interface, whereas um, the framework itself can uh, query and request stuff from the plugin through the input method interface and also through the Q widget interface. This Q widget is um, a special. Each plugin that we load up gets its own dedicated Q widget, which allows us, if you have several plugins running, to just shut off uh, one plugin by hiding it and then bring up the next one. So this allows, even though it all runs in the same process, it allows a somehow somewhat clean separation between plugins. So input method plugin developers need to be aware of that, that uh, the framework controls this Q widget and only gives, gives it to them as a dedicated proxy widget. The API that, I, that was mentioned um, is available at Gitorius. So input method and input method host interface is part of the input method framework repository. The words and handwriting recognition interface is in the input method engine repository. And feedback and reaction maps also have their own repositories. So this is not to annoy you that you have to actually fetch code from four repositories, but it's just how our development model worked and then it happened to be for separate repositories. But you should consider it all part of Mali as one framework maybe. Maybe we can improve the situation and restructure our repositories a bit so it becomes more clear. Yeah, so what to do if you want to create your own input method for Migo? Well, because we, we 
we want to de develop a lot of new stuff for MIGA 1.3. Maybe it's easiest to fetch the sources and um, compile it from scratch, although it can be a bit difficult at some times um, due to the dependencies and because we are, we are moving fast. But at least you're then aware of what's going to happen in MIGA 1.3. Um, if it's too fast for you, then stick, stick with 1.2 for now. And for that, we have a um, PPA on Launchpad. But yeah, that requires that you use Ubuntu, basically. With that, it's um, very easy. We packaged MIGA Touch and um, a 1.2 version of, of, of um, the input methods. So yeah, you just get the um, development files from there and get started on your host system. doesn't require any MIGA SDK or a whatever. You can just do it on your host system. Then, of course, uh, that's kind of general advice, create a trivial plugin. Don't try to do everything at once. Try to do something simple and get that to work because the interaction models that we have might be a bit confusing at first. So on, only if you get comfortable with that, you should move on to the more complex features. For testing your plugin, we, we have a demo application that is part of the framework as well. There's a, um, a demos or example folder if you go to the framework repository. And there you can find a very, very simple, cute application, which also has some error handling in case you do something wrong. So yeah, it's not very good, but it's a good start. A more complex example would be the Migo Touch widget gallery. Yeah, I know, Migo Touch, I said it, it's deprecated. But, but still, this widget gallery um, allows you to have some more complex interaction modes, like um, what happens if you pop up dialogue or what happens if you if the user scrolls the page and what should happen with my input method, whatever. It's a good example because it's more complex than our demo application. So for a trivial plugin, you, you don't need to do much. It's only these um, two classes um, plugin that actually is loaded by the framework and creates then the input method instance. So the plugin API, well, it might look a bit crowded here, but it's actually very, very simple. So the name is just an identifier for the plugin. In MIGA 1.2, it really is the ID that we use to, 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 to load the plugin. For MIGA 1.3, we actually just want to use the SO file name of the plugin, because that's, of course, also unique. And then the name could be something like a human readable string, for example. Languages as um, the list of um, supported languages, of course. Create input method, yeah, well that's, the in that's the factory now that creates the uh, input method instance. Then create input method settings is used uh, for, for, if you have a settings application to control certain stuff, which engine to use or how to behave for your input method, then you would put all that in a um, Qo graphics widget and uh, wrap that in this API and return it. This, with this factory, and supported states um, tells the framework something about what your input method actually is. Can it support hardware keyboards, or is it only on screen? Whatever. The input method API is actually a lot more complex than what's displayed here, but what you should first implement is really only that. There are some things one, have to, one has to consider in the, in the input method constructor. Show and hide is um, quite trivial. So on top of the Q widget that we show and hide from the framework, the input method also gets uh, notified that it's shown or hidden so that you can do some stuff there, and you have to. And of course, um, handle, up, uh, handle up orientation changed. This is important if you want to support uh, landscape and portray mode. Yeah, but basically that's enough to get started. So for the plugin, I, you need to make sure that it installs itself into userlib migoim plugins. That's where all the plugins currently live. As for the languages, just return some default value, like English. Supported states, if you want to get started, should probably be on screen. So that's OK if you, have, if you want to write a virtual keyboard. And we just forget about the settings for now. Just return a null pointer. It just, it just return null there. It doesn't matter. The name can be whatever you want. In MIGA 1.2, as I said, it's, the, it's also the um, identifier. For 1.3, we, we're going to remove that. Yeah, 
So this factory, you just have to forward these two parameters that you get there for the host and for the main window for this proxy widget instance and create your input method and return that. That's all you have to do. It's important to know that you um, should not, uh, that you're not in control of these, of these dependencies. So you should not delete them or something like that. Then, um, even in Migo, there should be a settings application that allows you to enable your plugin, but probably for a developer, the easiest way is just to do it directly through gconf. So that's what you have to do. So this is a um, key. Amigo touch input methods on screen enabled, and the other one is active. And in both, you would just write down this pair. So the SO name together with the um, current subview. Because your plugin is not going to support any subviews right now, it's only going to show one anyway. You can put there whatever you want. Yeah. So now, get now to the second class, the input method itself. So we have some convenience classes that you can use for your central widget, which are MIM widget and MIA graphics, uh, graphics view. They are just based on top of QWidget and QGraphics view. Um, they are convenience in, in that sense that they will automatically provide self-compositing support for your input method. Now what is self-compositing? Um, if you have an N900, you probably know the difference in Fremantle. If you show applications normally, then you have something like 30 FPS or whatever, and if you go to full screen, the performance suddenly doubles. With the self-compositing, we... 30%. Okay, 30%. Well, with, um, with self-compositing, we basically do the same, or we, we, we do the similar thing here. We, we, we bypass the system compositor, and that's, this allows us to, to bring down latency for screen updates, and it, of course, improves um, performance as well. We get, we have, get a high FPS. For us, actually, the lower latency was more important so that your screen, uh, that the screen updates happen earlier and that the characters appear earlier. So that's very important for a good virtual keyboard to have fast response. So if, if you have something like 200 milliseconds in uh, somewhere, it just gets jerky and it's not fun to use. Yeah. If you use this, these convenience widgets um, and if you want to have the self-compositing for free, you need to be aware that uh, you have to build up your whole UI in the constructor already. Because what we do, once we get your input method back, we go through the widget hierarchy, hierarchy from this uh, proxy widget and enable all these dirty flags that we need to make the self-compositing to work. Again, you can do it on your own. You can look in the implementation of MIM widget and how it's used, and then you get an idea of um, it's actually not much. It's just um, you have to do it correctly, and we do it for you. Yeah. Then once you show and hide your input method, you have to tell the framework of um, just how much space you are going to use on the screen. Uh, for once, as you probably noticed in, in Amiga, the keyboard is not um, full screen. It's interactive. So you can interact with the application while the keyboard is up. For that, you, call the, uh, you set the screen region, which tells, OK, which of the X events should go to the application and which X events should go directly to the keyboard. That's uh, that way you set the screen region. And then the other part is the input method area. This is what you say, well, yeah, that's the visible part of my input method. Usually, both are the same. But there are cases where they might differ. That's why they are both similar, yet different. It's important to notice um, that these regions and the area are both set in, in, in device coordinates. I'll come, to back, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Yeah, rotation support. You could probably leave that out for now. If then your plugin will only support landscape or whatever. Um, but if you happen to use QGraphics view, then it's actually very easy. You only have to create a, a scene, an empty scene, and put a root item there. And then build up your, your eye beneath that. So whenever you have a rotation request, you basically just rotate this root item. And everything else will rotate that's relative to that root item, so you don't have to do anything beneath that. You only control that root item, rotate that, and everything else will follow. So with graphics view, it's really easy to support this. If you have a classic QWidget um, um, input method, might be, a might be a bit more tricky because 
So you usually don't rotate the screen as with X render, you really just move inside um, a viewport. Then, um, yeah, how to get the input actually to the application. We use this uh, pre-added commit string pattern. Um, and you will find these methods on, on the input method host API. But in, in certain cases, even though you are a virtual keyboard, you need to send um, key events. Uh, one, one of these cases is usually the browser, which has its own plugin system, needs to forward some stuff um, to Flash plugins. They don't expect that there is a virtual keyboard. They always expect native key events. So yeah, there are some corner cases where you, where you really need key events. That's if that's too complex for you, or you just don't want to use C++ anymore, as I said before, you can use QML. For that, we, we pro also provide a convenience library. So you just have to include that in your project file configuration, ego am quick. And this is a very, very, this, this, this allows you to write a very, very thin um, C++ plugin wrapper. It's actually just two methods, name and QML file name. And QML file name is just the entry point to your QML stuff for us. Which we, so we set up the whole environment for QML, and then just will load this um, QML file into a declarative view for you. Then everything else then can be done in the QML side, basically. And um, for that, if you want to communicate with the framework or the application, um, we came up with a simple root context there, which we inject. And then you can access uh, on this m input method quick context. You can access read only properties to 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 create the screen uh, the screen size, the app orientation. You get notified, of course, on changes. And um, then for the other direction, you can also just um, call these slots for the input method area, or you can send a pre-added string commit string, and yeah, you of course also need to support plugin switching so that if some if a user has two plugins enabled and he switches to yours, he can switch back to the other one. We, we use for that, um, you, you probably noticed that, we use for that a swiping gesture. So you usually go through all subviews in, um, in, in the reference keyboard and if you come to the left end or to the right end and, and, and swipe further, it will just switch to the next plugin. For that you need this plugin switch required stuff. Yeah. But um, for us, the focus is not really uh, on this QML keyboard right now. We still have the other reference keyboard, and it actually has more features, has better performance, et cetera, et cetera. And it has actually good multi support as well. But this is actually the opportunity for you, if you're interested in QML, and you have ideas of how we can improve that or do that better, or you say, this API is not good enough, patch is welcome, really. I, I mean, this is work in progress. And as far as it's a side project, basically, so where we want to try out new stuff. So yeah, it's very easy to get contributions in for that. So I did use the same API for my own QML keyboard, of course, and put that on the N100. So this is not me, yo. This is really Fremantle with a QML keyboard. Yeah. Then. Another important aspect is cursor visibility. Because I said before, we, have, we don't have a full screen keyboard. Um, we allow full interaction with the application. So what does it actually mean? It means that the cursor has to remain visible, regardless of the virtual keyboard. So there's uh, one other aspect you find in Mego Touch that you can scroll, pan the application without losing the focus. So it will always jump back, which is actually very nice. If you would always lose focus while starting to pan, which is what you currently have in, 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 in Migo, can be quite annoying on, on long pages. And you see that we enter new lines here, and the input widget is just always scrolled so that the cursor stays visible. Yeah. As an input method developer, you, don't, you only need to support this um, uh, set input method area API that I showed earlier. And then, um, depending on the level of toolkit integration, th the rest just happens for you. Yeah, but of course, toolkit integration can be a bit complex. There are bugs. One is even in Migo Touch still that we don't relocate the dialogs back. So 
you, you focus on the dialog entry field, virtual keyboard comes up, it relocates everything, then you hide the virtual keyboard and everything stays up there, even though it should move down. So even in Migo Touch, um, what's currently available in Migo, there are bugs. Another one is that the Migo UX components don't, really don't even support relocation at all. Um, it's not really difficult to do, but yeah, it's out of my control. I can just say, yeah, you have to do it. Then we have to wait. <laughs> um, yes, I know. Screen coordinates. It's just, um, you get used to it, but the first time you encounter that, it might look a bit confusing. I know that because we got bug reports that we would report um, wrong regions to the application and we had to explain every time, no, 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 we, we are sending the right ones. That's screen coordinates. And then people were, what's screen coordinates? What's that? Yeah. So this is just an idea. As I said, we don't rotate the screen. We only lo uh, rotate logically inside a canva uh, canvas uh, viewport. So if we assume that landscape mode is, um, uh, uses a screen coordinates or it's, it's aligned with the screen coordinates, and it's, of course, everything like we would expect. To report the virtual keyboard area, we, we need to report the, the area that is covered by the point P up to the bottom, bottom right corner. And yeah, so of course, the, key r the, the rectangle, yeah, you, you start with the X coordinate zero, then the, um, the Y coordinate is um, the height of the visible application area, then of, and then just the width and, and height of the virtual keyboard itself. And once you rotate that, these logical coordinates actually stay the same. But what changed is that, you're, that this point P moved up to the top now. And when you create a, um, a, a rectangle from that now, you will notice how these logical coordinates just have switched. Yeah. So keep that in mind. You do that once, and then you get used to it. Another feature that, uh, that, we are, uh, well, that I'm starting to like very, very much, and also based on the feedback we got, application developers like this very much. So this is a mock um, email client where you can write some text or whatever. And you see it doesn't fit um, on the whole screen. You want to write some text, you want to write um, subject, email addresses, whatever. And there's a send button. It should always be visible, the send button, right? So the best idea is actually to make it part of the keyboard. And this is what you can do with the dynamic key overrides. The application needs to, needs to have control whether this button should be enabled or not. I mean, if you don't have a valid email address yet or no, no subject, perhaps this button should be disabled. But once you, you validate it, yes, this email address is actually valid, and yes, this, makes, this email has a subject, then you enable this button. Once you go back to the messaging part, you might want to replace it with a return button. And well then it obviously depends on the usability, on the experience that you want to have. You could say, well, if nothing happens for two seconds, we can switch back to the send button. And we only need to have a return button once the user th starts typing. Because it's not very normal to start with a return button. You start with some letters, and then, yeah. So the nice thing about that is, in your UI, you don't have to think about the send button. You just put it into the keyboard. Um, what I like about this API, even though it's um, a co <laughs> quite complex implementation in the framework, that it is very easy for application developers to use. So they have this um, M input method state class, which currently lives in Mega Touch, but we're going to fix that for going to fix that for one three. That's actually an easy part. This um, input method state um, has has this API where it can register an attribute extension and unregister one. So you register one and you just get an ID back, which is the identifier, an in integer ID, which is the identifier of your attribute extension, basically. And you have to keep using that all the time until you unregister it. Once you unregister it, the framework is free to clean it up, basically. The whole state is stored beneath that ID. So when you request uh, to set a, or when you want to set an extended attribute, this function might look a bit ugly, but it all makes sense. So the first one is just say the identifier. Second one is a target, or what I would probably say domain. Then um, third one is target item. So for example, for the return key, we have labeled that um, action key. So you just put action key as an ID there, and then it means, oh yeah, you want to modify the return key. There are probably going to be more IDs 
in the future, depending on what application developers request from us. So we need feedback there. And the attribute can be the attribute can be one of those that we see on the right, uh, on the left, in the M key override class. Label, icon, highlighted, or enabled. And this basically matches with, the, with these attribute strings. And the last one is then, of course, the value. For icons, it's the path to the icon. For label, well, it's clear. Highlighted, ena enabled, are just um, booleans wrapped in the Q variant. Now, all the ugliness happens, and all the state destroying, state handling happens in the framework. But if you write an input method and you want to support this, you will have to support set key overrides API in your input method. Um, so so once, once we get the request that we should change the button, we will just inform your plugin, and you are then free to handle it or not. But I would assume that once we make this a default feature in Mego 1.3, Application developers will expect it from every plugin to support or from every virtual keyboard to somehow support this mechanism because it's quite annoying if you have an UI that works with one plugin but not with the other, right? So yeah, this override, uh, this key override um, is actually not so bad. You just get a, um, a, a queue map that maps the ID, in this case, action key, <coughs> with a key override. That can actually be a set of key overrides. You can, you can, you can have more overrides at a time for the same key. No problem. So, so this is basically the code that I took from this um, email um, example. So that's what the application developers have to use. And I just wanted to show that it's not really difficult. So they get this input method state instance. They register an attribute extension. And then they just set the extended attribute as they want. So yeah, now the API actually looks way less scary there. And once they are done with that and don't want to use it anymore, they're just unregistered. And of course, you can go to the extreme with this. There's another example application where I just gave all keys identifiers. And I changed the labels. I switched them to highlight it or not. And yeah. Actually, I wanted to test the performance. This doesn't really work on the N100, it's too slow. So I had to use it on the desktop. <laughs> Just too many keys. And we don't have API where you can set um, more than one key override at a time. So each key override actually triggers a debug message. <laughs> so and it always has to update all keys. And yeah, you can imagine. Even if you have one or two milliseconds per debug request, it just doesn't scale. So maybe we're going to have a bulk update API as well. That's easy to do. If she has um, enough demand. Yeah, feedback. I told you haptic feedback. Um, as I said, I'm very sad myself that we don't have a backend, uh, at least for the MIGO devices uh, that are out there, because it really improves usability. I mean, the nice thing is you don't even have to look at the keyboard. You can st just start navigating from the left, and then you go, oh, that's the first key, second key, third key. Oh, yes, that's what I want to have. And it really helps with typing quickly that you have um, feedback. And there are two ways to do that. You can play the feedback directly through M feedback. I mean, I'm still going to present the interfaces that are there. We should start using them because at some point, I'm pretty sure we're going to have um, drivers, backends. I can't, just can't stay like that. So yeah, so you can play the feedback directly through the feedback interface or you can use reaction maps. Now, what are reaction maps or why are they there if you can play the feedback directly? It seems easier, right? These reaction maps provide very low latency. And with that, I mean, you press a key and the sound or the feedback is played before the screen actually updates the visual state of the key. So with that, you are, I mean, you can't get faster than that. Wha how it works is that there are somewhere in the system there's a feedback um, server instance and you communicate with that instance um, through some uh, shared memory, basically. And in this shared memory, you just um, draw a bitmap for your application or for your widget. And then the server sees that, oh yeah, on this feedback, if it touches the display and this application is currently active, then I have to play this or that sound. 
Um, of course, because we don't need to display any fancy graphics there, we can just downscale these bitmaps to just save, conserve on the shared memory segments. You have to keep that in mind when you, when, when you fill up these regions that downscaling is going to happen because it can affect your accuracy, right? If you want to make it um, a, a pixel perfect, then it's not going to work. I mean, you have to always imagine how big is a thumb, how, how big is a finger. So this target area, I mean, yeah. It's usually big enough that we can do this downscaling. And this, uh, this um, image is what you can get out of the reaction map viewer for a normal keyboard layout. And so the red, the, the red area is where you would expect some feedback. Of course, you see that there's no space between this, key, between this case. It's a continuous area. So you still have to solve the, key, the case where a user moves from one key to another. So this is something if you don't want to waste any reactive area on the keyboard, then you have to uh, handle this transition manually by direct playing, directly playing the feedback. So in this case, you are slower, but in all other cases, you are faster, in the normal cases. Yeah, I, I just can't tell you. <laughs> Um, so you can this this um, this reaction map stuff can support different colors for for different kind of feedbacks. So one color always encodes the feedback for press and release, and you can basically have as many as many different pairs as you want. And this is how the API looks like. Yes, you s you, you register an instance for your graphics view because that's what it what it is currently based on. Everything in Hamilton is graphics view based, so of course reaction maps are graphics view based. So then you can set the drawing value and then you just fill these rectangles up like you want. So what you have to keep in mind is that you have to, of course, clean up this area yourself when you um, hide a widget. Otherwise, um, if the reaction map doesn't match with your keyboard layout, yeah, the whole idea is lost. Then. This is um, some other ideas uh, that we uh, that we that were on the Migo wiki, and this was also pr quite easy to implement. A predictive keyboard. What is a predictive predictive keyboard? Well, it just highlights the keys that are most likely to be to be pressed next. So you start typing, and it thinks, oh well, maybe you want to type hello. So I'm going to uh, highlight E for you, just to make it easier for you to find. Um, this requires that you modify um, the word engine yourself somehow um, because the way you need to fetch the candidates uh, might be different. And the modification that I had to do to our virtual keyboard was actually quite small. Um, this highlighting stuff was, was quite easy. And the one thing that's not currently in the engine's interface, which um, should be fixed somehow, is that um, you cannot create um, the, the match length for the current set of candidates that you get back. You only can match, you can only create length once the user has selected a candidate. But that's useless for this predictive keyboard. So you have to keep track of the word length yourself to uh, poke the right index of these candidates. Yeah. So there are more ideas on, on, our, on our wiki page on what kind of uh, input methods you could write for fun. It's all easy to do can start with our reference plugin or start from scratch. Um, we have this ideas section there. Yeah, it's all on the wiki. And then I should probably cover the roadmap for Mega 1.3 a bit. It's also on the wiki. Uh, for some parts, we already have some detailed information, so you could basically start working on that or help us out. Um, one is support for non-X11 platforms. This is in alignment with the architecture decisions that we want to get rid of um, X and MIGO 1.4. So we're going to prepare for that with MIGO 1.3 as already, so that we can use, that we, so that we can hopefully use the Valent branch. Then, of course, the MIGO touch removal task. I mean, this is, um, I have to be honest, uh, we use a few bits in the, in the framework itself still, internally, but that's not much. It's um, actually easy to move, I think. 
but we are quite heavily dependent still on let me touch and our reference keyboard. So this task uh, focuses on that, that we want to get the reference uh, plugin, the reference keyboard, free of NeoTouch. The most complicated part actually is um, that we don't have a uh, theming engine yet for, for Meego. We don't know what to use other than the theme daemon that we get from NeoTouch. But yeah, we probably just have to come up with our own. Then uh, it's actually um, combined with this NeoTouch thing. We want to have better toolkit support. So for plain Qt, for Qt components, and maybe even for uh, pure QML. We, we have to see how difficult that is, because I think that um, if you want to have widget relocations, then you actually need this cute component somehow to make that work um, consistently across applications. So, yeah, I've also mentioned, I've also put um, GDK there. That's because it would be, it would be sad if you couldn't use the keyboard outside of Migo, for example, on, on GNOME or on Ubuntu. I think there are some valid use cases where it's just nice to have, to maintain that. Yeah. That's it for me. I now we can start with the questions. Yes. Um, can we get the microphone? I can, I can come right in. Good. Yes, there is. Okay. is it it's now it's available for both, but I'm not happy with the current state. I can tell you that um, the seeming for tablet UX is very poor because the keyboard there um, uses the handset resolution on tablets. So the keys are too small and it's left aligned and the color see, uh, colors don't really match. But that's um, only the visual aspect. As I said before, we don't have a word engine so you don't get error correction or word prediction, and that's really annoying because you expect that somehow on a tablet. Um, then there are bugs with the <laughs> compositor. <laughs> um, small things, details, but taken together, it's annoying. Yeah, but luckily you have the swipe keyboard. <laughs> so it's not too bad. I mean, you can use that, and it, uh, it's better polished for Migo than what we have currently. No, it's nearly 30 now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But as I said before, for these uh, CJK K languages, we actually need a engine, an engine. Yes. Otherwise, it's useless. You can have these pretty layouts, and it just doesn't make much sense. We have them, but you're not going to type fast with that, without an engine. Yeah, so uh, we, have to, we have to think about that. Ah, yes, right. Yeah. Um, there we actually use context kit, um, and we and we, we, we just um, listen to this property change there, whether a hardware keyboard or a Bluetooth keyboard is attached, and then we suppress the virtual keyboard because we say, hey, you already have one, you don't need us. So it should work out of the box, basically, but in the tablet UX, uh, on the exit PC and everything, we don't have it. We, we just, just the, the yeah, yes. Yes? Yeah. No, as I said, this, um, this override API is new. So we added that, I, I, don't, I don't know, we only added this um, beginning this year. So the cases with the hardware keyboard, the interaction modes with the hardware keyboard are not yet finalized. 
but you probably have a good point there. I mean, it's quite easy to say, hey, you still have um, some attribute extensions here. They are active. Um, you would have to remove them. So we would probably have to notify the application to, to change the UI, or we have to maintain a small set there. We actually can do that already. If you have the hardware keyboard, we can show the um, um, keyboard toolbar on top of it so that you get some more actions. But as you've seen, and or maybe not have seen, in MEGA 1.2, most applications don't really make use of the IM toolbar. It's, it's there, but no one's really using it. Yeah. So maybe we, our idea is that we're going to get rid of the toolbar at one point. Maybe we're going to use it for the terminal application. Yeah, it makes sense, because you always want to have these actions there. But for other applications where um, you have more dynamic use cases, um, this toolbar will merge with this key override stuff. The API is already merged, and we're going to phase out this um, direct toolbar support. And yeah, that's it. Yes. What about if you have a, let's say, a game that doesn't do it in Tuesday? Is it support? We don't support. <laughs> Officially, we don't support games. <laughs> And officially, we had this discussion, right, with a proxy text entry, where you would just put a proxy text entry on top of the keyboard and move that with up. So then you, you somehow use that. As, so we, we provide a proxy text entry where we can do all the stuff, and then we just have to wire somehow the, the, the input from that to the application or to the game. So this um, allows us to not have Oh, this would free us from having to implement widget relocation in each game, right? It would look a bit funny, but it would work. But what if you don't care about the widget relocation? Let's say that the game decides to keep the text entry in the proxy or something like that. Do you guys try to make the text entry part of the game or part of the game? Yeah, but let's say that you kind of want to copy paste some Yeah, th this API is, of course, always still there. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, yeah, the DBus API. Uh, we managed to clean that up. Uh, so now there are no cute types anymore in this um, e API. So I hope it's um, more toolkit friendly to use that. So the DBus API will always be there, but we don't um, advertise it as the official API. I mean, it's stabilizing now, but I can still see that we make changes to this communication protocol um, because we have some asynchronous um, communication issues and synchronization issues there, so they're not really what we want. But yeah, of course, you can use that. Yes, please. That sounds like an input method plugin to me. Yeah, yeah why not? Or that. Choose. <laughs> okay. Actually, I did that. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I made a check last week to, to see um, how much adaptation is needed. But um, our current master compiled just fine in the Mega 1.2 images. If once you get these development headers, but they are all available. I didn't even have to activate any extra repositories.
Okay, thanks. Okay.